Welcome back to NPTEL, the national program on technology enhanced learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in module 4 of our series of lectures on English language and literature. Module 4 as you know is being devoted to literary criticism and today we are in lecture 10 of this module. This lecture is entitled post colonialism and uh, in a moment I shall be uh, telling you how this lecture is going to be structured. But before that let us do as we always do a recap of the last lecture and the last lecture you will recall was devoted to the topic post structuralism. Uh, for instance, we saw through Chris Barker in his book The Sage Handbook of Cultural Studies, wherein he says that the word post as a prefix okay, obviously suggests after okay, and therefore post structuralism in a sense is obviously after the school of criticism or even philosophy as we may put it known as structuralism. right? But the important point that we uh, found in the last lecture as is being argued by Chris Barker is that the post does not mean simply okay, uh, an after in the temporal sense. This after is a little complicated in that if we look at these words here, they in this involves both the absorption okay, of key ideas from structuralism and also a critique and transformation of them. So, what, did, what do we find here? That in that post structuralism is both a continuation and a critique okay, of the structuralist enterprise. Next, um, we found that uh, where is in structuralism meaning as given to us by Saussure is understood through a system of difference, hence meaning is known as being differential and through a system of relations okay, among the various units of a system. We found that language and structuralism is a self sufficient system wherein meaning uh, emanates okay, through a system of difference and relation among the units of that system. Right? Then we also found in, in structuralism which is going to you know uh, which is going to be radically critiqued by post structuralism. We found in structuralism that meaning uh, comes about through the organization of science and you remember this was an important word in structuralism and the stability of meaning okay, is achieved through the structures of this organization. Okay. So, it was a neat way of understanding um, almost a formulaic if you may say a way of understanding meaning uh, emanation in language. Okay. Then we found that post structuralism followed or critiqued structuralism in that it saw uh, the production of meaning through science as endlessly deferred. So, uh, we found for instance through Derrida that it meaning was not only differential, but meaning was also deferred or meaning was also postponed. Right? So, no text had a complete meaning in itself or the authoritative meaning because by the very nature of the science system. Now, the post structuralists we saw did not you know uh, did not say that there uh, was no structure. Their job was to show us the structurality of the structure itself okay, that the structure is there. right? But if you look at it closely you can dismantle that structure because the sign uh, you know uh, the uh, you know they, there are no pure signifieds that is no signifier okay, which is a part of the sign no signifier has a or an authoritative signified. Okay. There may be many nuances to a sign and meaning be precisely because you know this is turning the structuralist claim uh, you know on its head right this is precisely because meaning comes about by a system of difference that system of relation and difference is a fluid one 
Okay, this is what we had seen and then as we see in this slide, we found uh, the word, word difference given to us by Derrida that is which is a, a combination of to differ and to differ. Okay. Then an important point that we found through say philosophers like Michel Foucault was that the subject, okay, the one who experiences right, is actually an effect of discourse and this is a word we shall be coming across again in today's lecture and we found that the subject is really an effect of language according to the structuralist claim and language and practice, right, discourse and practice cannot be separated. Right? Our practices are also an effect of language. This is something that we had discussed in the last lecture, I did not go into it again. And we found that discourse is really or language is really you know a pow the power we can, we can term it after Michel Foucault as the power to name. Right? Discourse has the ability to create a subject to create its subjectivity, to create its identity, uh, you know indeed to create its most uh, personal or in private or feelings right. These are all understood as the effect of discourse. Okay? Uh, we, for instance, uh, if man is understood through the discourse of religion, uh, man is you know the effect uh, the subjectivity of man is understood to be an effect of the larger discourse of the religious kind. Right? Therefore, we, we found that this is a term which almost you know this term here is a linking a term that links us to post colonialism. We found that this is anti essentialist. Now, if you recall from previous lectures, uh, what is essentialism? Essentialism uh, means that there are essences to things. Okay, that things have essences in themselves. Okay, there is something ontologically, philosophically speaking, there is something ontologically true of things. Right? But post structuralism, in denying a determinate meaning, in denying uh, uh, the you know uh, um, an authoritative meaning or the meaning of things, okay, becomes anti essentialist. Right. So, things, um, texts are amenable to several meanings. Now, again as I said in the last lecture, this does not mean that anything goes. Okay. It simply means that there may be readings of texts that do not follow or even radically question uh, assumed uh, certain assumptions of patterns of reading, of techniques of reading, um, bringing out some other relationships in the text, which are otherwise you know hidden by you know what we call the dominant modes of reading or reading practices. Okay. So, this point takes us directly really to the uh, lecture that you know or rather the, the topic of discussion today uh, that is post colonialism. Now, I um, will take the help of a glossary um, you know of literary and cultural uh, terms given to us by Peter Brooker. It is a useful book you may look it up, it is a glossary of um, you know literary theory, terms used in literary theory and he gives us these three terms okay, po all starting with post, okay, post structuralism, post modernism, post colonialism and he says that you know uh, we have to look at the term post here as I said a while ago in terms of changes and departures not in terms of clear cut from previous from the word without its its prefix post. Okay. For instance, post structuralism is a change and departure from the structuralist mode, post modernism is again a change and a departure, but with link, you know obvious linkages uh, to modernism and post colonialism is also rendered a problematic term in the sense that the post here is simply not a dividing line between you know a colonial past and a post colonial present. These terms I need you to understand are slightly more complicated than simply being a temporal term. Okay? Now, what is common among these three terms according to Peter Brooker? We have see, see we have post structuralism, post modernism and post colonialism. He says that these three schools of thought 
Okay, among other things, right? Obviously, this is not an exhaustive li list. Among other things, they point to difference, a term that we already found in post-structuralism. They point to the most important, one of the most important, uh, you know, terms, not simply in literature but also in philosophy, which is meaning. You know, the uh, emanation of meaning or the formation or the construction of meaning. Critique, right? Critiquing established modes of thinking okay, and identity. So, difference, meaning, critique and identity are some of the terms or some of the you know you could say um, some of you could say some of the goals or you know some of the important constituent uh, you know terminology in post colonialism, post structuralism and post modernism. Okay. So, these are basically the terms that these three ways of thinking grapple with. Another you know before we go into post structuralism uh, proper, another point that I would like to raise here is there are also critics that have drawn or pointed to the you know the similarities right both political and discursive between say feminism and post colonialism. Okay. For instance, uh, these are um, uh, my own words here, which I would like to read out. Scholars have often pointed to the complementarities shared by post colonialism and feminism. Okay? As both discourses, at, they are at once discourses and they are at once struggles. Okay? So, as both discourses and as the struggles of real men and women, their concerns have hinged largely around the question of human dignity, freedom and the opposing of oppression that ranges from opposing the creation of cultural stereotypes to actual bondage. Okay. So, both feminism uh, just a while ago we saw the similarities between post modern modernism, post colonialism and post structuralism. As far as feminism is concerned, okay, it shares you know um, it shares with post colonialism um, the uh, not just you know not just uh, certain discursive terms, okay, but also the more important political, okay, political opposition to dominant uh, genders on one on the one hand and to dominant races and nations on the other hand. Okay, so both have human dignity, human freedom, um, and the opposing of oppression, okay, as their ultimate political goals, right? So, as complementary discourses in the general rubric of contemporary literary and cultural studies, the two discourses of feminism and post colonialism have raised this is extremely important epistemological challenges from the point of view of discourse. Okay, there is of course, the larger political end to be met, but also from the point of view of discourse. Okay, the challenges have been as deep as raising epistemological questions. Okay. So, uh, some of you may have come across the term epistemology, you know epistemology is a branch of philosophy. Okay. Epistemology, I do not know if I have mentioned this or will be mentioning this in one of um, our lectures here, uh, but let me go into this a, uh, a bit. Epistemology is a branch um, of philosophy which deals with knowledge. Okay. It is also known as the theory of knowledge. Right. So, epistemology raises fundamental questions about knowledge. For instance, beginning with a question like what is knowledge? Okay? What are the sources of knowledge? How do we know that a piece of information is knowledge? What is the difference between knowledge and belief? Right? When and how does a belief become knowledge? Okay? Is it at all possible for us to have complete knowledge? What is truth? as far as you know, knowledge is concerned, what is the relationship between knowledge and truth etcetera. So, these are as you will understand you know that these are very fundamental questions. So, uh, both feminism and post colonialism you know they challenge the epistemology, they, they raise epistemological challenges to hegemonic structures. For instance, feminism would raise epistemological challenges and challenge the knowledge formation, okay, the way knowledge is formed through a patriarchal discourse that favors men. For instance, post colonialism would, would uh, you know uh, launch an epistemological attack on say uh, to be to say very loosely here really to, to a dominant uh, so called western way of constructing knowledge both about itself 
and the other. Okay. So, as let me quickly read this again, the discourses of feminism and post colonialism have raised epistemological challenges to hegemonic structures and this is important here both in academics and in policy making. Do you follow? Okay. So, what we have done till now is we have looked at the similarities between uh, or among post structuralism, post modernism, post colonialism and feminism and we have used one word if you recall here we have used the word uh, anti essentialist all these are anti essentialist. Uh, discourses okay or as we say should be anti essentialist discourses okay it shouldn't be that feminism becomes an essentialist discourse in its bid to try and oppose uh, structures that have been there because of patriarchy more about this uh, you know the dangers here uh, towards the end of this lecture right what then is the epistemological challenge that is being made by post colonialism let's look at this slide uh, carefully here. Okay. We have this word here the orient that you, you are aware of these two words the occident and the orient. Okay. The orient is here referred to the east and the occident to the west. Okay. So, what are now let, let us raise this question what are the epistemological challenges that are made by post colonial writers, post colonial authors, post colonial uh, critics post colonialism as an enterprise as a theory as a discourse and as an academic and political enterprise does this okay it looks at let's look at this slide here it looks at it studies or explores and critiques western structures right now in western structures we may add terms like discourses and if you remember discourses are what discourses are ways of speaking about something right for instance, if you recall, if we look at man as a religious, in you know, a point on the discourse of religion, okay, there is a way of talking about man. Okay, there is a way in which we define man. There is a way in which we uh, talk about the purpose of why man is, uh, you know, uh, why man exists in the first place. For instance, and if we talk from, say, the discourse of biology, for instance, okay, then the definitions would change. Right. So, post colonial critics hold that the West because of imperialism, because of actual annexation, actual rule domination for you know uh, because of which we had cultural uh, domination to an economic uh, domination, they built certain discourses, okay. they built certain ways of talking. For instance, when the British were in India, they had certain discourses, certain ideas of the so called natives of people in India and they had a certain way of talking okay, about, uh, about the natives. Right? So, first the, the epistemological challenge is to the discourse, right? where has and how has this, this knowledge okay, which has given rise to a way of speaking to has given rise to a terminology, how has what are its sources? Okay? what are its limits that is what are the conditions under which such knowledge has emanated in the first place. Right? So, there is an attack on uh, the discourse okay, positing if we may use the word a counter discourse to the main hegemonic western discourse the discourse that has come from the occident the, uh, particularly through imperialism. Right? Now, this, this is the first level in the second level we find that there is an attack or there is an uh, you know a critique of the ideologies that have uh, now what are video ideologies if we say that discourses are ways of speaking then ideologies we may say are ways of seeing the ways of seeing uh, or you know but the particular lenses through which uh, you know uh, um, intellectual moral right uh, lenses through which you look at something anything any phenomenon any person uh, any race, any community, any subject okay, and you hold which gives you certain ways of looking at that. So, the, you will understand that discourse is, discourse is not separate from ideology, right? ideology ways of seeing give you a certain discourse, okay, ways of speaking. Ways of speaking also on the other hand feed into your way of looking at something, way of ways of seeing something. right? So, it is um, argued that the West right in post colonialism it is argued that the West has created certain discourses 
ways of speaking and ideologies ways of seeing as far as the east is concerned okay then find uh, after that culture what are you know how is the culture of you know the, the the native okay that is the colonized country how is its culture uh, viewed how is it judged right how is uh, you know um, and how it shows in the discourses on the ways of you know speaking and writing about india for instance by the britishers right so uh, the study is also there are also, ep also epistemological questions relating to culture and finally constructs what are the constructs okay what are the images that we have by the colonized uh, you know colonized uh, nations on the colonizers. Now, this is oh, simply because uh, we have just be begun to get into, into post, you know to talking about post colonialism in a, an elementary sort of way. It is not always the fact that in post colonialism you study only the colonizers knowledge or the colonizers discourse and ideology. Okay? Uh, a very important part of it is how the colonized right during colonization okay, have looked at the colonizers what are the forms of resistance more about this a while later okay but simply because i was talking about epistemology and the challenges to the core structures of knowledge that is why we have this slide here and in that way we can say that the discourses the ideologies the culture and constructs of the west as far as the east is concerned are what are critiqued by the post colonial critics right so definitely how do we then bring in the term anti essentialism if i asked you um, this mode of looking at western structures by the post colonial critics how is it anti essentialist okay uh, you know sort of essentializing of the colonized people was created by the western structures to, to put it very simply post colonialism uh, has had i will talk about that it was the end of this lecture there are so many uh, you know there are many ways in which post colonialism may be may also be critiqued right in a sort of quite uh, what i feel are a certain myopic ways of considering the west however we'll begin by talking about uh, the main orientation of the post colonialism there is therefore you know a very important binary here okay this is what we call the otherization the otherization here this binary is the division between the self and the other this is this lies at the core really the crux of post colonial criticism on in one sense the self is say the colonizer colonizing nation the other is the colonized and from another perspective when we are talking from the point of view of the colonized, the colonized becomes the self and the colonizer becomes the other. You know this elementary binary opposition here between the self and the other is at once the defining crux of post colonialism okay, as well as its theoretical limitation right. To be always seeing and considering the the uh, you know the colonizer or the colonized which in whichever perspective we are taking as the other right is to miss out what we find in the interstices of this binary okay is to miss out certain other kinds of connections certain con complementarities more about this later we first talk about post colonialism really right then uh, come to this a while later right now i said that um, as with post structuralism as with post colonialism okay post uh, sorry post uh, modernism post colonialism can also we cannot really divide have neat divisions about say from this date post colonialism begins like we can't have definite division about when post modernism comes away from post uh, uh, or post modernism sorry comes away from uh, from modernism there are many who have said that post modernism is nothing but uh, you know, uh, uh, and in, in, you know, and to to quote, um, I I forget the name of uh, uh, the theorist. Anyway, to to you know, to see postmodernism as uh, an incomplete project of modernity, right? So also in postcolonialism, right? You cannot really pair out, you know, the colonial and the post uh, postcolonial. Uh, A as I said, because um, there are problems with 
the binary opposition between self, other and colonizer, colonize. Okay. Oh, another point of view also, uh, the anti-colonialist discourse is something that has seemed to be sort of given a, a short shift because of of post colonialism right post colonialism in a sense of course is the culture the ideology the discourses after actual you know decolonization right or actually you know of a, of a colonizing country leaving the the colonized country to its to have its own government etc independence for that matter right okay to put it simply but for instance if you look at this slide here there the uh, the theoretical political impetus was given uh, not necessarily within right post colonial setup. For instance, uh, you may have heard of Franz Fanon, okay, uh, who you know a writer who was deeply uh, you know involved with the struggle for independence uh, in Algeria from independence from France. Okay. Uh, Fanon uh, gave us some of the most important you know uh, explorations, particularly from the point of view of uh, psycholinguistics and, 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 and psychopathies, also, right, um, of what colonialism does to the psyche, to the individual, and the collective psyche. Fanon himself was a psychiatrist, okay, who served, and uh, you know, uh, and he saw uh, as a doctor, and he saw firsthand, uh, you know, the outcome of the colonial. Um, you know the colonial um, encounter, not only you know from uh, uh, not only on what happens to the colonized population in the colonized nations, okay. Also, what happens to the colonizing forces? What happens to, for instance, for a white soldier, okay, who is in Algeria? You follow? So Fanon here says to speak means above all to assume a culture to support the weight of a civilization. Okay? Now, this is from his book of uh, black skin white masks and one of the most fundamental aspects of you know uh, problems in this colonial post colonial uh, setup is that of language. Okay? When one when a colonizing nation sort of imposes right, its language on the natives. And Fanon, for instance, says that you know to speak any language is not just to speak the language or to know the letters and to know the grammar of the language. It also is to assume its culture, its values, its epistemologies, and <coughs> as I said, excuse me, the weight of a whole civilization. Okay, if you look at language very deeply, you'll understand that language is not simply uh, having competence, linguistic competence. It runs far. <coughs> sorry far more deep. Then, when we come to post uh, acad academicians in post colonialism, right? when you come to literary and cultural criticism in academia, there are several names here of course, but the most important here uh, or the ones that have been foregrounded uh, in anthologies, in discussions, in books are these three names, okay? Edward Said, Homi Bhabha and Gai Homi Bhabha not the scientist, okay? Homi Bhabha the theorist and Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. Now, if you uh, note, uh, look at their biography, you find that these are not uh, these are not uh, people from the West. Okay, they have come to the West, joined the academia there, and there was a time when post-colonial criticism, right, um, was inaugurated, so to speak, as an. Act. Now remember, we have Fanon, we have others like Amy Césaire, for instance, okay, uh, who talked about anti-colonialism. But when you talk about post-colonialism as you know uh, being being part of being made part of the literary uh, even canon, so to speak, then we talk about writers like um, Bhabha Said and uh, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. And we'll look quickly uh, at at these and how they are, uh, you know, critiqued and what their some of their formulations are. Right? Some of the points uh, that they have been 
uh, you know, collectively looking at and, uh, and uh, each of them giving more, more emphasis on some of these points here are again similar points that we will find in postcolonial literary criticism and cultural criticism. And these are for instance identity, the question of identity in, um, uh, in a postcolonial situation okay, of reappropriation of cultural and linguistic reappropriation by people in a post colonial setup. Right? Uh, questions of resistance, how literary texts and other cultural objects have resisted. Remember what, 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 what we had uh, seen a while ago, resisted we had those four terms the discourses you know for instance the ideologies and, and uh, you know uh, uh, the culture for instance and the language of, of the uh, colonizing nation. Okay? So, how uh, you know writers creative writers have resisted those dominant structures, th those dominant epistemies and brought about a reappropriation of uh, reappropriation of their uh, you know of their native cultures. Right? Um, here in this lecture, I am not going to talk about any one critique or I am not going to you know discuss um, the individual contributions of critiques. This is more of a general um, you know lecture, so that you can understand overall in overall sense what post colonialism or the post colonial enterprise entails. Okay? So, there are questions of identity being looked at by these critics of as I said resistance and re resistance to to the other culture and reappropriation, uh, um, you know, redeeming, so to speak, so to speak, or redemption of one's own culture. Right? Uh, subaltern is an important term. Uh, also, uh, as Pivak herself has said, uh, often misunderstood term. Uh, subaltern is a term which has been revived by uh, Gatry Spivak in her theory contribution to theories of post colonialism. Okay, the term subaltern actually comes uh, you know is a, a military term it comes from the uh, you know from a position in uh, you know uh, in the forces in the army. Okay. So, one of our more very important and also controversial essays is can the subaltern speak okay, the question of agency in the natives in the colonized people how far they have a language and a discourse of their own in broadly speaking. Then another term hybridity and this term again is um, is uh, attributed to homi bhava and this is this talks about the hybrid condition of the post colonial uh, struggle so to speak between his or her own culture and that of the colonizing uh, nation even in a post colonial setup okay um, where for instance just because you are you belong to an independent nation or nation that has become independent after um, uh, you know, a duration of uh, uh, you know being having been colonized, doesn't mean that from that date of independence that you, uh, you know, your um, orientation, your um, you know, uh, your uh, so to speak, your values, your constructs, your ideologies that they have been completely snapped. Okay, so an important point to realize is. Um, you may be post colonial from a temporal or time point of view, but the structures remain. Okay? So, much so that there are so many critics who say that um, the British have uh, you know they left India, but handed over the same structures to a middle class bourgeois leadership okay, uh, without much changes. We also see this in the phenomenon called neo colonialism for instance. So, according to Bhava and many other critics we are really in such, situ such situations the, the post colonial is really a hybrid uh, and never really post colonial cannot be a post colonial. Okay. Uh, next there are also um, you know post colonial criticism also looks at efforts uh, you know uh, or you could say um, assertions of cultural belonging right questions of cultural belonging not in the sense simply of appropriation or also but also as you'll find in uh, in many diasporic writers for instance uh, cultural belonging becomes a highly problematic term in the sense that you um, the texts do not show a, you know a clear belonging sense of belonging to a culture is is in particularly in diasporic writers the problematics of cultural belonging and power it is not that other writers not critics not talk about power, but this uh, also is um, an important contribution uh, by Edward Said. 
if you recall Foucault, okay, one of the most important terms in the whole critical terminology of Michel Foucault is power. Okay. And Said's Edward Said's works like Orientalism, uh, Culture and Imperialism, okay, uh, obviously very, uh, show the influence of Michel Foucault. Okay. Uh, power and discourse, these being the two most important theoretical, you could say, pivots that Said had borrowed from Michel Foucault. Okay. So, see, these are really some of the terms that you should talk about in a, in a, in a, in a when you are beginning post colonial studies. And at the same time, we have to understand that these terms simply do not mean a uni or one dimensional way of looking. The colonizer, for instance, okay, the colonizer is also, it is also a change of subjectivity and identity in the colonizer when he or she comes into contact with the colonized civilization or the colonized culture. It is not that the colonizer in any, col in any colonial, situa colonial situation, it is not that the colonizer just stands back and starts making pronouncements on the colonized. Okay. A post colonialism that is a sophisticated one has to look at these hidden uh, you know aspects of subjectivity of identity of cultural belonging for instance of power okay it's not uh, you know so many have crit criticized and i would say rightly so uh, works like edward Said's orientalism which was published in uh, 1978 i think okay where he says now let's look at this slide here and that book he says uh, talks about orientalism as a systematic discourse by which europe was able to manage Look at this, manage and even produce the Orient. Look at this. Said says that the Orient, the East, was systematically produced, okay, constructed, okay, managed, given direction to uh, where discourses were created, okay, by the by Europe, okay, about the Orient, about the East, in so many different ways, politically, sociologically, militarily, ideologically, scientifically and imaginatively. If you look this uh, at this even as a standalone quotation, you will find that it is a one you know one directional or one dimensional way of looking. There is no, he is not talking about the Orient too not simply in a temporarily post colonial situation, even within a colonialized situation, uh, the Orient too having its own structures about the West. So, this is one of the problems. Nevertheless, Orientalism, his, his work Orientalism, uh, I said nine, published in 1978, um, clearly showing the, um, you know, uh, Clearly showing the in, uh, you know uh, showing inspiration from Michel Foucault as far as discourse and power relations is, uh, are concerned was a seminal book. It was a landmark really, from which uh, uh, you know people took the cue, critics to the cue, uh, took the cue and started to improvise on it, started to show the, the multiple directions and dimensions of it, but really without having I would say to grant uh, Edward Said, uh, you know this, uh, without a book like Orientalism, you would not probably have had post colonialism, post -colonialism as you know an academic, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an academic discourse that had enormous sway at least during a certain period of time and uh, you know in uh, uh, you know, in sort of the rarefied realms of academia. Okay, so this was a book that sort of inaugurated it, right? Um, then, so uh, well, also if you look at, you know, uh, say if you want to compare, this is the next point that I would like to talk about. When you want to compare postcolonialism, say, to its kindred terms. Okay, for instance, what are its kindred terms? Some of the synonyms really are. Commonwealth and talk about post colonial literature, some people say or commonwealth literature or third world literature. Okay. Now, the point that is raised by students is are these the same? Are these three terms commonwealth, third world, and post colonial the same? Uh, from the point of view of time, from the point of a temporal dimension, I would say we would safely say that post colonial is a uh, is a relatively newer term. Okay, we've been talking about Commonwealth literatures. Um, the discourse of Commonwealth literatures is not, uh, I would say, uh, not so anti-essentialist, not so radical, 
as that of the post colonialism. Neither is third world, the term third world literature. Okay. Post colonial uh, post colonial criticism as a discourse has a far larger terminology, right, has had a far a more longer sway, right, and is far or uh, you know would say far more um, uh, you know uh, far more has sought to be far more powerful okay, both discursively, academically and politically than the kindred terms commonwealth and third world. Right? Uh, that is why we, we have clear terms in post colonialism as I said the subaltern, uh, you know uh, orientalism, uh, then, um, uh, then uh, you know post colonialist discourses for instance, hybridity, liminality, there are clear cut this is really a discourse that has grown uh, and has as I said earlier has had a longer sway in academics. What I am going to do is now I will quickly uh, read a passage from a book edited um, by Carol uh, Breckenridge and uh, you have some very, very, uh, very fine grained and very important uh, uh, re looks as there are re lookings into orientalism in Edward Said's orientalism which talked uh, uh, as I said about the way the west has been uh, sorry the orient has been constructed systematically and managed in many different directions and dimensions by the west. So, this is an important book if you want to move uh, you know further from orientalism and look at the critique and you know improvisations of orientalism. Uh, she says and I am reading from her uh, first chapter post implies that which is behind us right and the past implies periodization. This is very clear very simple right post is of course, something that is already is past right is, uh, is behind us talking about something that we have left and now we are in a post situation. We can therefore, speak of the post colonial period as a framing device okay. this is very important. It is not simply about, about talking about a past a colonized past that has gone and being in a post colonial situation, it is an epistemologically, it is a framing device that is you have a different paradigm if I may use the word, it is a paradigm is a strong word here, let us stick to framing device, it is um, you know it is a framing device as she says to characterize what the second half of the 20th century right. The second half of the 20th century may be looked at through the lenses okay, or the framing device of post colonialism. The term again she says post colonial importantly you know it displaces the focus on post war. Okay. So, it is another post here right, it displaces the focus on post war as a historical marker. So, there is a you know it, it makes a shift from a framing device which is mostly ba mostly based on the discourse of war and post war okay, replaces it with post colonial right uh, as a historical marker for the last 50 years. Post war refers of course, to the period after the second world war and although the war was central to decolonization etcetera, it is used to periodize history much less frequently in the ex colonial world than in the metropolitan worlds of Europe and America. Okay. So, post war uh, even if it talks about uh, decolonization okay, we will talk from a European perspective do you understand okay. and it is much it is used to periodize history as she says much less frequently in the ex colonial world. Right. So, the post war for a, you know a, an erstwhile colonized nation post war is not a strong uh, as far as resistance is concerned as far as writing back is concerned okay. I forgot to mention this very important book the empire, empire uh, writes back sorry the empire writes back. Um, this is a book that uh, is immensely important as important as uh, Edward Said's um, orientalism for instance. Okay. Um, you may want to look up that text right. So, this the discourse of post war is of no use when you uh, you know talk about post colonialism and for the ex colonized uh, nations right post colonialism is a far more politically charged and far more useful and powerful framing device right. So, then she says to call the second half of the 20th century post colonial then is to call for a reappraisal, okay, re understanding a relook uh, of the way we frame contemporary world history. So, there is a 
you know it is a different again this is a different discourse that needs to be highlighted as she says and to re-emphasize the rupture in national and global relations created by the urge to forge independent nation states right. It brings to our attention the relations between colonialism and nationalism in the politics of culture in both the societies of the ex colonizers and those of the ex colonized. Now, um, there is just one point that I have said I because I mentioned earlier that I would be dealing with it and this is you know the critique of post colonial post colonialism and post colonial criticism. And I am reading uh, from um, uh, from Peter van der uh, who is one of the uh, editors I think of the book by Carol <laughs> Breckenridge that I had, I had uh, mentioned. He says that although we have to admit that this is a forceful vision post colonialism, it is also surely and he is very categorical in this, it is also surely a misleading one. It is itself a product of orientalism since it neglects the important ways is so important here you know you see ways in which the so called orientals not only have shaped their own world, but also the orientalist views criticized by side. This is what I you know had mentioned earlier about being in the interstices of the binary between colonizer colonized ok. To look at what happens in between, to look at it not simply as side looked at it as a systematic construction, one sided construction of the orient. Here Van uh, Der Veer is talking about how also to you know the need to look at how the orientals, so called orientals have not only as he said shaped their own world, but also the orientalist views criticized by side. It would be as he says a serious mistake to deny agency to the colonized in our effort to show the force of colonial domination. So, unwittingly post colonial criticism may sometimes end up end up kind of undoing itself in the sense that it, it establishes and re establishes the force of colonial discourse and domination ok when it sees the west east, east being completely created and managed by the west and we have forgotten ok to study the contribution of the orientals in this whether it is regarding orientalism or regarding its own uh, reappraisals and its own attempts at reappropriation. Okay. So, we come to the end of this um, and you know uh, what I am going to do is if now I am going to uh, pose a few questions and I will give you some hints as to how, as to, how to answer these. Okay. For instance, if you um, if you begin by saying you know name, name uh, three uh, three prominent post colonial critics okay, uh, with their uh, corresponding or respective imp you know important you know important terms that they have contributed to um, the post colonialist discourse. Then you would say that these are among others Edward Said and for uh, with him the terms uh, orientalism right uh, based on on uh, the influence of Foucault the terms like discourse and power, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak and her among others you know her important term the subaltern. A subaltern of course, as I said was not a term constructed by uh, Spivak, it was the term that comes from the military and was used uh, by Antonio Gramsci very productively. Okay. Then uh, Homi Bhabha and his important terms of hybridity the hybrid condition okay, the mixed condition the liminal condition of uh, you know the both the post colonial and uh, you know the colonizer and the colonized. Okay. Next if you are asked a question like how does post colonialism give an epistemological uh, challenge okay, to dominant discourses then you will say that like post modernism like post um, structuralism okay, post colonialism also makes epistemological attacks or rather attacks on the epistemology of how the west has created its knowledge particularly how the west has created the knowledge of its other which is the east or the orient. Okay. So, it will talk about how what the sources of such knowledge are, what the limits or conditions under which such knowledge has been formed, the uses to which it has been put, the nature of such knowledge. Okay. Then uh, um, if you know you uh, get a question like what are the most important uh, you know what are the most important terms in post colonial criticism in the sense of what are the most important points 
uh, that come up in discussions of post colonialism, then you would say that words like identity, subjectivity, okay, appropriation, reappropriation, discourse, power. These are some of the terms of subaltern, liminality, these are the some, some of the important terms and important issues that are discussed. Uh, mostly issues of identity in so called post colonial nation states, right. Uh, these are some of the more contemporary issues being discussed, right. And finally, if you get a question like how do we critique post colonialism? Post colonialism critiques western knowledge formation about the east, right, uh, about the erstwhile colonies. How do we, you know, what are the criticisms to which post colonialism itself may be? Uh, what are the dangers of doing post colonialism in a so called narrow way sort of way. Then the answer would be this some of the answers are you know they go like this for instance post colonialism of the Saidian kind as we find in orientalism uh, has been guilty of a sort of one dimensional way of looking you know the traffic is one dimensional the west has created the east. Do you follow? Okay. So, these are some of the dangers some have also seen you know people who are critics who are against postmodernism have also seen postcolonialism of a more discursive kind losing you know out on many other uh, in, you know uh, you know urgent issues uh, local issues you know by talking about globalization by talking about neo colonialism by talking about the colonial enterprise we are we also not uh, sort of uh, not looking at or giving importance to what happens within the nation so, the self other binary of colonizer or say of colonizer colonized is so huge in this discourse that it uh, sort of seems to do away or, or uh, sort of neglect questions of what happens even within the colonizing setup. To understand some of the more important questions have been raised by feminists for instance okay, regarding the, why, uh, the black woman and the difference between the black woman the political. Uh, power differences between the black woman and the black man, right. So, these are other binaries that also get formed, but if we are in the larger discourse of uh, the, the all important binary of colonizer colonized and these are some of the issues that get sidelined, right. So, again as I said I have not taken up any book any, any work at length, I have I've tried here to simply tell you what post colonialism is what its orientation is, what its goals are okay, and post colonialist uh, criticism, literary criticism okay, would obviously look, look for uh, you know the te you know text both from the colonizer and the colonized uh, worlds, cultures and look at how as through you know Sidian lens how the west has created the east and uh, from other perspectives for instance from Homi Bhava's perspective okay. The the hybrid the mixed uh, uh, you know the, the nuances of hybridity of people who straddle two cultures okay, even in a so, so temporarily post colonial post independence situation. Okay. So, there is lot of course to be learnt here lot of course to be uh, you know you can look at the empires uh, empire rights back uh, you can also look at orientalism and look at some of the new books that have come up right. Uh, thank you so much and we shall meet again in the next lecture.